Won't you please join me in welcoming them um, for a great conversation. Thank you, Fran. Um, and thank you all for coming out on this cold night. Um, we're gonna give you about 10 minutes of questions and answers at the end, so hold your questions and comments, please, until then. Um, I wanted to start off by having both of our guests tell us the history of their signature dish, um, and I guess the thing, one of the things that they're serving tonight. So, Pierre, can we start with you? Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the history of my signature dish at Yolele, at Teranga, actually, Yolele is the food company, and Yolele Fonio is a Fonio grain. Fonio is a grain I've been championing for the longest time. So that history is really started 5,000 years ago. That's how old the grain is. It's one of the oldest cultivated grain in Africa. And um, it's, it's very relevant to me. It's very important because culturally, the, the region where I'm from, that's where Fonio has been, uh, really, that's where it survived because you don't see Fonio in the rest of Senegal, in like north of Senegal, in Dakar, in the city. People are still looking into crops that are imported, they still look down at the crops like Fonio because it's just what we call the colonial mentality. We think what's coming from the French is better, so we have baguettes and croissants every day, but I'm diverting here. The, the <laughs> <laughs> I tend to divert, so I'm happy to have Julia Moskin moderating today. Um, what, what really uh, triggered to have this dish become a signature dish for two reasons, because this grain is important to me for that, uh, for what I mentioned earlier. But uh, the dish itself is called jollof fonio, and you will have it today uh, as a tasting. Jollof fonio is a dish, is a very controversial dish in Africa, in West Africa in particular. Jollof is seen in Nigeria, it's seen in Ghana, and it's seen in Senegal, and few other countries in Africa. But each of those countries are claiming to make the best jollof fonio. <laughs> And, and it's a serious war. It's really, really, it's the, the kind of the wars you love, there's nobody's dying from it, but it really, I mean, you have government getting involved, government officials having comments on it. Nigerians, of course, are the loudest, even though <laughs> Jolof is coming from Senegal, that's the name of Senegal traditionally. So the, the history of the, the, the dish comes really from the Senegalese uh, culinary tradition, and that's how it, that's how it became the, the, the the, the dish And of does choice. it resemble any of the grains that are commonly eaten in the American diet? Is it in uh, any of those families? Well, it resembles couscous, but couscous is not a grain. Couscous is like a pasta. Mm -hmm. um, but fonio is an, an, a whole grain. It's, the grain is the size of couscous. It's tiny. It looks almost like sand. And uh, so that's the only resemblance. And nutritionally speaking, of course, it uh, compares to many highly nutrition grains. It's, a, it's a, actually a nutrition powerhouse in its own uh, right. And was there ever a time that it was brought over to the United States by enslaved Africans, like rice apparently was? Fonio didn't, for some reason, didn't make that trip because um, it's, a, it's a complicated grain. It's a grain that takes quite an effort to process and uh, rice was quite easier to process than fonio, and uh, it was it it grew it grew easily in uh, in the North Carolina yeah. regions. And so that's how it was imported by by African captives. Fonio, there are traces of fonio only in uh, south of uh, Haiti in the Dominican republics, and they call it Findi there. But that's the only place that uh, slave trade brought Fonio to the, this part of the world. Yeah, otherwise. I had never had it before. No, um, most of you did but it. But the diversity of grains is, do you feel like people are very receptive to that now? Absolutely, people have been really amazingly receptive and uh, the, the media has been great. And we started in the market in 2017. Today we are pretty much in a, uh, distributed across the United States. Whole Foods is going to be distributing it in two months in all their stores. You know, right now we distribute it in the Northeastern region and we are in those stores, uh, we champion in our category in those grains. So it's, it's really being really appreciated. For different reasons, it's a grain that digests so easily too. It's really, it's a very light grain. And uh, it has, uh, in addition to being nutritious, it's also low in the glycemic index. So it's, uh, you know, it's recommended for people with Diabetics, for instance, or people who are looking for less sugar in their in their diet. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Now for something completely different. <laughs> Pastrami and rye. You yeah, can do a, little a, bit, rye. a bit different. Um, a bit different. Although there is still that controversy of who uh, who made the makes the best pastrami or the best uh, best matzo ball soup. Um, so yeah, we're we're serving pastrami, which is uh, um, obviously very near and dear to a lot of uh, uh, Ashkenazi Jew Jews and to New Yorkers and to New York transplants all over the world. Um, and pastrami, you know, in Delhi in general is a tradition that sort of came from Eastern European Jews immigrating over. Um, and so it provides a lot of comfort in the same way that matzo ball soup provides comfort, uh, you know, whether it's, a, it's the flu or a, or a broken leg, it seems to do the trick. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone's grandma has a recipe for, for matzo ball soup. And uh, yeah, although there is actually there is some grain in that as well, I guess the matzo the matzo meal. Matzo That's meal, right. yeah. So pastrami, I actually just learned today when I was researching, um, was actually very specific to Romania. Like they don't eat it in Poland and some of the other places where a lot of New York Jews came from. It's very specific to Romania, <coughs> and there was a uh, little Romania along Rivington Street, which I just had never heard of that, even though my Parent, my grandparents lived on Orchard Street. Yeah, absolutely. So that's there's there are a couple conflicting theories about the roots of pastrami. Um, you can find evidence of it, say in Turkey, for example, with a, a dish called pastram, which is a little similar in the spices. Um, you can find the same flavor profile in other dishes, uh, but ultimately, it's foods brought from the shtetl over to the Lower East Side, sure. right? And so. You know, whether it goes up to Russia or down to Romania or, or anything in between, it's kind of this blend of food and culture that, that happened. But it's really about how it was applied to meats that were available here. Right. Because it was actually mostly made with goose, which was something Jews used to eat a lot in, in Europe. Um, right. And then we beef. couldn't get it here necessarily. So then we applied it to the more expensive cuts of meat, the navels. Um, we used the same techniques for tongue, uh, briskets, uh, all these things that now can be considered delicacies and are way more money uh, to buy. But back then, were really inexpensive cuts of meat. And um, so, so, yeah, it's just about apply how do you preserve something? How do you make it taste good? How do you uh, make it last for a month when you got to feed your whole family on that single piece of meat? So like Italian-American food, um, you know, the amount of meat in the diet became enormously more when people came here. And I think the pastrami sandwich is a good example of that. Do you know when the sandwich at Katz's got so big? <laughs> uh, uh, that would be before my lifetime. Really? So um, I am not 100% sure. Um, but have you ever tried to shrink it? To shrink it, I, I think... Um, there's a lot of people who'd be very mad at me if I tried to shrink it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but we did start offering a half a sandwich with a soup. That's oh. a bit more of a, you know, balancing act. I, I'm not asking. It's not too much pastrami for me, I assure you. It's just, um, you know, as, well, you know, meat has now become a very complicated matter. And um, you said that, you know, you do have vegans who come in and have their once a year pastrami sandwich. It's the cheat day, exactly. Um, how much does a pastrami sandwich cost you? More than the matzo ball soup. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's one of the tricky things of the deli business when you think about the economics of the business. Um, you know, like a fancy French restaurant can, if meat gets really expensive, can not have meat as their special, you know, for the night. They right. can do a mushroom dish, or they can do a this dish, or they can do a that dish, whereas in a deli, <laughs> not really. You know, when, when meat goes up, you, that's it, mm -hmm. and you have to deal with it. Uh, and that's kind of what's been happening industry-wide, uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Um, so Pierre, well, I'm sure price, is a, price point is a factor, both Ashkenazi Jewish food and many African foods were considered in the category of like things that should be cheap, you know, things that people don't think they should pay a lot for. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a French restaurant can charge thirty-five dollars for, you know, a small steak. And <laughs> so, um, 
Pierre, how much of a factor is that for you now when you're thinking about dishes? And also, I know, I mean, I, you've been a chef for a long time um, in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And how much resistance was there in that area uh, in price and other things when you first started opening African restaurants in a world that's not very familiar with that? Um, well, for, for me, it was, I had two challenges. One was not only to introduce a whole new uh, food culture, in, in New York that was pretty much unknown to, to see African restaurants. It wasn't as mainstream as, you know, um, Jewish food or, or Chinese food for that matter. So it was a whole education. And uh, for, to educate people, you have to be very careful as how you price. You know, you can't just scare them out. And that's really one of the main reasons why I chose this format that I have right now, Teranga. Teranga is more like a fast casual where you can pretty much assemble your own bowl. You can come and, and decide. You you are just, a, in a sense, a partner with the chef because you decide at the end how your plate will look like. You can decide if you have fonio or will you, will you have fermented cassava couscous from Cote d'Ivoire or will you have this red rice from Liberia. And, uh, and then you can decide not to have meat or fish. You just have it strictly vegetarian and it's uh, as perfect and uh, comforting meal and it can be less expensive so so i decided this format because that's easier for for me to to present different new ingredients and that's also easier for for the customer to to adjust to the budget and it's not so scary i mean i'm not um not gonna come and also pretend to give away things because the ingredients have a cost especially the way we source our ingredients we we are working with farmers in, in West Africa in particular. This part of the mission is to not only introduce the ingredients, but to also support an economy, you know, support those farmers, increase the, the livelihood of the far those farmers. So there's a cost to, to bringing those ingredients. The fonio <coughs> comes in the United States in shipping containers. You know, there's like, after that, there's a whole cleaning, another step of cleaning and packaging that comes. There's a cost to all of it but we still managed to keep it in a reasonable price. Um, the average table in at Yolele would be, less, at Teranga would be less than $16. I tend to go between Yolele and Teranga, they're both names that are part of my, of my businesses. So Teranga is $16, you can come and you can have a drink, homemade drink, either uh, Bisab, which is the hibiscus traditional Senegalese drink, or you can have your ginger drink, or you can have the baobab fruit. Baobab is also an ancient uh, a tree that lives to be a thousand years, and the fruits are like really, really rich in vitamin C and, and very just delicious It's in its own right. We have a baobab cocktail that we make with coconut milk. So you can have all of that. One of the drinks, you can have your full bowl for $16. So the price is pretty much controlled for New York, New York, uh, New York price. How much is your pastrami? <laughs> Twenty-two. There yeah. we go. <laughs> um. <laughs> I was thinking about a forty-two-dollar burger and fries. That, there we go. That I ate <laughs> on Sunday, which was quite a shock. It's, out, it's outrageous. It's, yes, exactly. There's truffles in it. <laughs> the best burger no. of all time, Jeez. No, and it was shoestring fries, which I don't even like. Oh, boy. So, yeah. Um, and obviously, price is a factor for you. We already talked about it a little bit. But do you feel like people are beginning to understand that, you know, if you're getting what is it, half a pound of meat, that, like, that's going to cost something? That it's, it's more like three quarters of a pound of meat. So it's hopefully you're, like, it, it's not just a price point, it's a, you're getting value out of it, right? For some people it's two meals, for some meal, people it's just one really <laughs> heavy meal. Um, so, uh, you know, it's about, we, we try not to keep, you know, raising it as, as much as possible. Um, but, so, you know, in, and I, you know this, in New York it's hard. It, it gets harder and harder to do business in New York City. Um, mm. And so you do what you can to try and keep the prices reasonable and to keep people happy and make them, you know, want to keep coming back and give them something that's worth no. the money. And it's, it's hard. Yeah. 42 is crazy. Though. The grain bowl is going to save everybody, but you can't do that really. I can't. Oh, you could do, I can't do a grain you bowl. You could yeah. do kasha. 
I could do kasha. Yeah, that's fine. I do. I have so I, that's the thing is I have all these other. I have latkes. I have matzo ball soup. I have blintzes, and that's where I can, you know, keep prices a little more reasonable, and I can make a little more mon- money than I can on a pastrami sandwich. Mm. Um, but ultimately, a lot of people just want pastrami or corned beef or brisket or turkey and. Right, because traditionally one of the things about a comfort food would be that it wasn't expensive. It would be something that, you know, was within reach of, of the whole community. Um, anyway, um, so well, I have questions about the various innovations um, going back to the Reuben, because obviously you mentioned you have blintzes. Um, was it ever a kosher deli? And how has that no, changed? No, so at one time we were kosher style. Um, which <laughs> really means mean? nothing, nothing. It, uh, in no way, shape, or form. Um, well, that would probably mean that you wouldn't have dairy, even though the meat means. was yeah. not kosher. It, it just meant there was no cheese in the store. Mm-hmm. It, you weren't kosher. You didn't pretend you were kosher, but you didn't have the stuff that would make you not kosher in the same fridge. Right. I'm like, that's kind of bullshit. But, um, <laughs> um, but everyone so, had their workarounds. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and then about. Forty years ago, uh, we we added Swiss cheese because enough people just kept asking, um, and enough customers just pushed it, pushed it, pushed it, and finally we said, "All right, fine, I guess." I they guess wanted can, a Reuben. I guess no, it was just Swiss cheese on it on the sandwich. Okay, and a lot of that came from the West Coast, and if there's any West Coasters in here, I'll I'll pick my bone with you later. <laughs> um, no, pick it now. <laughs> well, it's it's when they come in with like avocado requests that I really just want to smack. <laughs> Again, sorry to any West Coasters. I'm not sure. Don't you hate that avocado thing? <laughs> yes. I thought you might be referring to the Thousand Island dressing because there's a lot of mayonnaise that goes right. on on the West Coast. Right. Right. Yeah. Mayo in general shouldn't be on pastrami, and that's mm-hmm. another rant and rave I can do for entirely too long. Um, so, is a Reuben technically it's corn corn beef, right? Right. So traditionally, again, it wouldn't be a traditional deli sandwich. No, no deli would have a Reuben Melted because cheese. you wouldn't have cheese in a deli. Um, so, but then as delis made their way from the East Coast over to the West Coast and then back, it became a tradition to put cheese on sandwiches, which then morphed into putting sauerkraut, which was already in the deli, with the cheese, with the Russian dressing, all on the sandwich. And then so the traditional Reuben is with corned beef. And then, so we added that to the menu. Eventually we caved. Um, and then, you know, the rest is history. And then now people want pastrami Reubens, which to me is... A little too much flavor, like it's... That's like, a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really a lot. A lot going on. Um, but listen, to each their own, and if you come in and you ask for it, I'm happy to serve you. <laughs> as long as you come in, I'm happy. You're happy to sell it to you. Good, good. Um, oh, Pierre, I'm so interested in your restaurants in, uh, in the cities, in Africa, so in Lagos and Dakar. What is the dining scene like there? And I realize that's an enormous question. Yeah, it's a it's a good question actually. The dining scene has been evolving. Um, when you see, for instance, Dakar, I grew up in Dakar. We didn't uh, grow up going to restaurants. You know, every every household would have a, an amazing meal every day, just fresh. Market is done every day, and in Senegal, pretty much every woman knows how to cook. It's a gender-based activity. Cooking is like belongs to women, and I don't know what I'm doing in this world, Max. But, <laughs> but, well, but you didn't get into it until you <laughs> until were I here, until right? I got here yeah. until and then I went rogue. Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, but in in Dakar, we we didn't need to go to restaurants. You know, the restaurants was for expats for the most part, and uh, and that's really the reason why even today, most of the best addresses. Are restaurants that are not uh, really introducing African ingredients or African food. They are presenting French. There's great French restaurants in Dakar, great Italian, Japanese, you name it. And that's the same case with Nigeria. So when I, I decided to work in Nigeria, actually I was invited to design a menu for this restaurant in this beautiful um, complex store called Alara. And, um, I just really, I had written my first cookbook at the time and it was really about the ingredients that we ignored even in cities like Dakar where I'm from. You wouldn't see those ingredients. Um, They weren't really uh, 
promoted, to say the least. You know, you'd go to restaurants and hotels that was mostly French stuff, and uh, and people were quite happy with it. And I was here in New York introducing these ingredients, and it was quite amazing how the reaction was not only the Senegalese wanted it, but the New Yorkers were open to it as well. So I was like, it should be the case in Senegal. And when I went back to do this job in Nigeria, I really wanted to focus on just introducing the food from the region. You know, Nigerian, Senegalese, Cote d'Ivoire, you know, that's like, you no, know, those borders are, are really, not really real, they, they, they imagine borders, you know, they, I mean, they, they were imposed upon us. But when you look at the food itself, the food transcends those borders. And that was easy for me to, to, to do that in Nigeria, I mean, to, to bring the concept because the food was there, the flavors, we had the same understanding on how, you know, our food uh, should taste and how it should evolve and the texture and everything. It was really interesting experience. And working with the chefs there, in my team and to make them understand that this is the kind of food I wanted to bring in the restaurant was even that was a challenge because all of them were like trained chef but they're trained chef in French restaurants in, in you know whatever was the restaurants but but they were Africans so just introducing them to the food that they know the food that they they ate growing up was so such a great experience, you know, because you could see them really reacting and connecting to it. And they were like, oh, wow, we're going to be serving jollof, or you're going to be serving suya. And all those things were like, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't connect at first because like, well, we're downtown, we're on Victoria Island, it should be a, a French restaurant. But then it came to be, you know, uh, this, this experience that we all lived in an amazing way. And today, five years later, knocked by Alara in Lagos is like, the destination restaurant in like expatriates as well as, as locals, they just love it because they, 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 they have an experience and whenever they come, it's just like they, they travel really, they, the, the expatriates can taste flavors that they never had and the locals can connect with flavors from their memory, really comfort food, because that's really comfort food that I brought back there. I didn't invent anything. I just took the traditional food and deconstructed it and represented it in a plate, and they connected with it. And I did the same thing at the Pullman in Dakar, which was a, a French hotel in the middle of Dakar, but now they're serving West African cuisine, and it's really a destination, to just because it's something that, I mean, we have great cuisine, and we never really gave it a chance. And right, sense. it wasn't uh, considered the restaurant food. Exactly. Yeah, it was the same here, really. Yeah, I can um, imagine it. Well, I mean, everything was French until not that long until ago. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, in the Ashkenazi Jewish tradition, men did not do a lot of cooking. Right. Um, Although to be a butcher, I right, guess, it, usually. I was just going to say, the, the meat aspect was uh, considered more job for the men, and then everything else was for the women. Um, but yeah, all that's. But um, sorry, the question that I wanted to ask was um, about how you know Pierre says he took these you know familiar ingredients and made them more elegant and presented them in this fine dining um, yeah, aesthetic I don't, I don't do that. language. <laughs> um, and now some delis have, and of course now there are more like you know Jewish chefs who are expressing their you know their traditional food as well here, um, and of course your. I don't know if they're your nemesis, but Russ and Daughters obviously has um, tried to move in that direction with their aesthetic and the halva ice cream and introducing new ingredients. So what is that like for you? Um, so truthfully, I love all of that. I love all of anyone who wants to go out and kind of do something different with Delhi, do something fun, do something unique. Um, I love it. I think it's great. I think it can attract new people to eat, maybe who didn't know this type of food um, and then bring them in and, and then, you know, that's not our role. Our role is to be the keeper of a food tradition that's largely disappearing, right? It's to be exactly the same as when you, you first came in or when your grandparents, you know, brought you or whatever it is, you know, I want to provide an experience that's the same and that's nostalgic and that it's traditional. Um, so let other people do the fun, cool, creative stuff, and, and, and then I can teach them some more about where it came from. 
Yeah, and I, I think at the end of the day, we always come back to this place where it started. Because if you, you know, sometimes chefs tend to just forget the, the source where it started. And, and that was brings really weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it I'm talking really about. Good, right? but I mean, it, yeah. but it, it does get crazy sometimes, you know. And, and that's the moment where we need to, to go back. And it's for me, it's important. Even Teranga, Teranga will really present the traditional cuisine. That's really the, the vision is to present the traditional cuisine. That's really where, where the classics are. And that's what inspires me. All, all the food that I do, even when I go and deconstruct, is always connected to the roots of the cuisine. Ultimately, that's what makes people happy, right? It, it exactly. makes their soul happy, and it, it's something more than just food at that point, when it's something they can connect to like that. Totally, totally. That's the love ingredient, and I think that's yeah. what people feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the comfort food aspect, obviously, is um, something that you want to preserve. But a lot of families, of many immigrant groups um, who were in the food business, got out of it as soon as they could. You know, like two generations, three generations, and that's what happened with your family, with the Katz family, because that was, like they were done, they didn't have, their kids were becoming dentists and doctors. And Right, that's yeah. the Jewish mother's dream. And, and I think it's every mother's um, dream. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's every mother's dream, yeah, fair. Um, I think, you know, it, it was seen as a, not a glamorous job, but something you did out of necessity. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, um, now that it's gone, people look back at, at it and, and look, miss it and look at it fondly and are, you know, are, want to reconnect to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the short story, or the, I guess, there's been a lot of families involved with Katz's over the years. My grandfather was one of about four or five different families at that point. Um, and to your point, like, it's just next generations that don't, care they don't want to do it that it's it's a headache because it is a headache right <laughs> um but um you know it's a headache i wouldn't trade for anything in the world personally and is it something that you always thought that you would do no i thought i was going to be a doctor oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah of course um uh yeah so i i took the mcats um i would interviewed i was heading to med school and I was taking a year off to help my father and uncle out and <laughs> no. here we are <laughs> here we are 10 years later <laughs> so they didn't at that point I mean do you ever think look around and I'm like what am I doing like slinging pastrami when when the fire alarm goes off, it's yeah, not as sometimes. prestigious yeah. as like being a chef and having an international, <laughs> you know, now there is a certain cachet to that. No, uh, yes and, and no. And there is also I mean, now, I think, a cachet, however, to being a deli owner. There, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe I should be a lot fatter and bolder. Um, <laughs> but um, I think uh, uh, short answer. I wake up every day excited to go to work, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good sign that uh, I made the right choice. <laughs> um, and I, I get to connect to people and in a way that I don't think I could if I did anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of the beauty of, of Katz's is, is everyone, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that have a story, right? A, their Katz's story, their thing that connects them to Katz's. And I get to be sort of the keeper of those stories, which is an amazingly incredible job to have. Mm. And are you out there in the restaurant, or are you, you're not in, hiding in an office somewhere? I'm there six days a week, except for when I'm here, apparently. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, and I, I, I'm out on the floor a lot. I do, listen, it's a restaurant still business, so I still have to go to my office, unfortunately. Um, I hate it. It's like most restaurant offices, it's tucked away in the back, and there's no light, and it's miserable experience in there. But um, I... I prefer to be on the floor, I prefer to talk to people. I'm not a particularly shy guy, so I, I enjoy that mm -hmm. interact that customer interaction. So who trains the pastrami cutters? That's a good question. How many, um, how many decades does it take? So that is something that you have to earn and take your time to get to. Um, that is one of the most coveted positions in the store. Uh, and any of the guys that are behind the line have been working for my family for at least five years, sometimes 10, um, minimum, before they can even touch a knife. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then we start with slicing bread to teach the knife skills. Um, listen, I, I, you can teach. You don't use a bread slicer? Uh, no, this is just practice. It's oh, like okay. a, yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that is artisanal. You should be selling that. <laughs> no, we, we definitely use a bread, bread slicer. But, um, but all the meat is cut by hand, right? We cook it so long that if you tried to run it through a slicer, it would just crumble right through. So you have to be trained not just in how to slice it up, but how to take out certain sections of fat, certain sections you can't eat. Um, so you have to learn how to take care of the meats before you can even slice the meats. And before any of that, I'm like, I'm not just not gonna waste my time teaching you how to do it if you, I don't already know that you're part of the Katz's family. You know? mm, mm -hmm, and years. we have people who are second, third generation in their family working there, which wow. is pretty amazing. Hmm. Um, how, what, how are we doing on time? Franny? You can go to questions soonish. Soonish, okay, maybe just um, one more each. Um, so, We've talked about the, you know the meat the meat problem, um, and Pierre. One of the, I mean, I don't you know I think overall the food that you serve is probably much more sustainable and environmentally friendly than beef. Um, but no, it's not. I mean, many restaurants are beef. But um, is is palm oil a factor for you? Are those choices becoming more difficult? Obviously, um, you know, in my job we hear like you shouldn't be eating this and you shouldn't be eating that and you need to know where your coconut milk is coming from and there's a lot of responsibility um, in eating and in health. I mean, I feel like people used to really blame the Jewish diet and the salt for a lot of things. Um, so, you know, if that comfort food becomes like problematic or unhealthy, like what do you do? Do you change the food? Do you change the customer? Um, well, no. I mean, no. the customer's mind, not the <coughs> No, this is a very good question. Yeah, actually, <laughs> actually um, uh, our traditional West African comfort food is great for the environment, really. It really is. Even uh, when it comes to the palm oil, and I'm going to shock a few people here because palm oil has re received such a bad rap. And it is true that palm oil is, is terrible for the environment when it's uh, is, um, grown the way it's been done, mostly in Southeast Asia, where they're destroying forests to grow their palm oil. But in traditional West Africa, the palm oil actually are wild palm trees, you know, and that is still the case in the way we source our palm oil. The, the way we use the palm oil that we source at Teranga is palm oil that comes from Senegambia region. You know, that's a, that's a wild palm tree that hasn't been, we didn't destroy any forest to grow this palm, this palm tree. And this is why it's important to, to really know, to be able to trace where your, your ingredients are coming from. If you understand that your, your ingredients can affect the environment and you do something about it, and this is what becoming a restaurateur and a chef is more and more important and relevant because we have to be mindful because we are uh, not only we are trendsetters in a sense uh, we can we can also affect the environment you know like you mentioned avocado for instance i don't use avocado in my restaurant because i mean it's just crazy and everyone wants avocado and i should do avocado but i'm like why would i do avocado when i'm so conscious of growing for new and pick, pick, uh, selecting crops that are drought resistant and I know this avocado is coming from Mexico and it's been also, or, or even from the Amazon really, they, they, they destroy forest to grow these avocados. That's the same way as I won't use palm oil from Southeast Asia, from Malaysia, from Indonesia for the same reason. Not because palm oil is bad for you. Palm oil is not bad for you. Palm oil actually is, a, is an oil that has not only a great antioxidant, but really high amount of vitamin A and high, high amount of beta carotene, which is like 11 times more beta carotene than carrots itself. You know, but there is a whole, that's my theory, okay, there's a few people. <laughs> when you see most of the criticism that coming from palm, about on palm oil are coming from the Mediterranean area. So there's a, it's a whole, it, there's lots of lobbying that's happening and we have to be mindful of that too. You have to be mindful of the way you source your ingredients. We're not gonna get into politics. I mean, food can be very political and we have very little time left, but uh, 
I do use palm oil, but I source it properly, and like as I use the other, other ingredients that I use in my diet, and it doesn't alter the, the, the tradition of the food. The food remains authentic in its flavor, and this is really the nature of our, our food, our traditional food is, this happens to be healthy. Right, because you don't have to cut down palm trees or cut down other kinds of trees and plant palm exactly. trees to have a sustainable use of, of, the, oil, of yeah. the oil, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so obviously most people who come to Katz's are already meat eaters, but even meat eaters are becoming more conscious. Do people ever want to know about the sourcing of the beef or, you know, yeah. are these, were these happy animals? Is, are they grass fed? Yeah, we, we sing them songs. Um, <laughs> no, so we, um, are in a, uh, I, I believe a very lucky position. Um, Cause we, you're a big buyer of, we are, of meat in New Yeah, York. we're the single biggest buyer of a sec, of navels. That cut. Of, it's a very specific <laughs> cut, but so we're dropping the bucket in the market as a whole. We, we slaughter 560 million pounds um, a week in this country. Um, we use 30,000 pounds. So we're a drop in the bucket, but 30,000 pounds is a still a week. It's still a lot of meat. Um, so Is that like this entire room? A little bigger. Um, no, so we, we get like a tractor trailer mm -hmm. every week. So, um, and we're in a lucky position now where I can actually demand to go and see everything up the chain. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, and I, I've visited the slaughterhouses and the farms that they come from. And in fact, we stopped working with some of those suppliers that we had been working with for many years. Um, for one reason or another. Um, right, because I, worker health is also a factor. I mean, there's, there, I, I'm not gonna go into that because it, there are some things that are really a bit nauseating uh, and there are issues in that industry that I wholeheartedly believe are major issues that need to be addressed. Um, but where, you know, we can be in a position where we don't buy from those places, That's where we can go to places that we vet and we go to and, and one of the slaughterhouses sends us a link to a, they, their whole facility is on webcams. Mm -hmm. They say, blog in anytime, we don't care. We got nothing to hide, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing when you think about that. Yeah. I mean, um, so so yeah, we I, I do believe it's a responsibility uh, as a restaurant owner and mm -hmm. we, you know, we can influence these things and make some changes, even if it is a smaller scale, even if it is a little bit, we do what we can and, and hopefully make well, those changes. Yeah, I mean, if you don't, who who will, you know, not the government apparently. <laughs> all right, um, we would be happy to take some questions. So I can't see all that well. If we could raise the house lights. Yeah, I can't see some of these questions. Oh, great, yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, I have a question for Del. Thank you, by the way, for the talk. Um, Two-parter, one, your review of the pastrami at Meshugana and your second favorite pastrami in the world. Uh, what, at where, I'm sorry? At Meshugana. Uh, I, so I actually haven't tried it. Um, my, what, it what is it so that we can all? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a very famous pastrami restaurant in Argentina. In Argentina, okay. So, interesting. Um, Argentina has wonderful meat, um, great, uh, um, meat scene, I guess you could say. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if it's, if it's excellent. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of traditions that make its way to other places and then work its way back turn out phenomenal. So I'm sure it's really good. I, I haven't tried it myself. Uh, my second favorite pastrami, shit, that's a good one. Um, uh, I'm very picky about my pastrami, um, as you can imagine. I've yet to find one that I really, really love uh, as much as my own. You're not even gonna throw them a bone. <laughs> um, so I, I went up to, uh, to Montreal to Schwartz's and they have a wonderful uh, food there. I just wish it weren't like, I didn't think about it as pastrami. I thought, if I thought about it more as, as barbecue, for example, it's slightly different cut slightly different set of flavor profile, but really excellent, really delicious. It's really great. Anybody else? Oh, hey, I see you. Yes, hello. Over there by the wall. Okay, well, I grew up with send a salami to your boy in the army. You know, that, that was a, a, the 
legend in our house, and also with the memory of the terrifying waiters at Cats. You know, who's... We still have those, don't worry. <laughs> and um, I know that the cost of labor in the restaurant industry has really skyrocketed here in New York, and I'm wondering how uh, the new minimum wage and the... Um, uh, the training of wait staff really affects the business that you have. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, it, you have to make sure you really like somebody, <laughs> um, but because it can be labor can be very expensive. It, it means that all prices kind of have to go up as they go. Um, it's not just there. It's you know every part of running a business in New York gets more and more challenging, um, but. I, you know, we're lucky that we don't have a, a lot of turnover. Uh, we have 150 people, um, and 100 of them have been with us for over 10 years. So, um, and do you train them to be mean, or do you hire mean people? <laughs> I, I encourage them to be mean, uh, you know, with the New York edge, but ultimately pull it back and be nice, ultimately. It's a delicate balance. It, it's a really delicate balance. Yeah. Uh, you, know. <laughs> you just say, like, you, you curse a customer out just a little bit, but not fully, right? <laughs> Who else? Yeah, I'm sorry, you got your hand up. Dr. Pierre, I was wondering if the grain is gluten-free. Yes, yes, absolutely, it's gluten-free. <laughs> is it like, um, is it like quinoa? Does it swell a lot when you cook it? Do you just have to soak it like couscous or? No, you, you can, it cooks in five minutes. I forgot to mention, that's like really a fast cooking grain. Um, in a, you boil it, you boil it in water, you can steam it like, like you would do couscous. And if you cook one cup of fonio, you can end up with having four to five cups of cooked fonio. So it's like a very generous grain. Um, yep, you further back and then yours and then we probably have to wrap it up. I'm a, I grew up on Katz's, but I'm a great fan of Taringa and I was wondering where are these other branches going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, Ida, Ida wasn't supposed to publish the, article, the news today, so. <laughs> but since it's out there now, I will tell you, uh, we're opening March 15th on uh, 53rd and Lexington in the City Corp building. Oh. Cool. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> and then uh, the months after, at uh, following your steps, we're going to the Calb Market, which is really back to Brooklyn, where I started my first restaurant. We get to be neighbors, and we neighbors, and I want to be like cats in hundred years. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, you did have a question. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just project. Uh, Pierre, so very happy about 53rd and Lex. I worked right near there. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, the, the inspiration again was West African. I wanted to have those flavors, and you can add it to yourself. Can you, Pierre, can you just tell everyone? Oh yeah, what those, they are? those condiments. So one of them is called shito. It's a it's a fermented uh, spice sauce, really that comes out with dried shrimp. So not very kosher, dried. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so dried shrimp, dried crayfish. That's been cooked very slowly with lots of onions for and, and Cameroon pepper for you can cook for four hours really slowly until it becomes almost dark black like the color that you see. So that's one one condiment full of umami. Another one is a sauce cani that's inspired by the Senegalese way of we call it pepper jam. You know, it's not sweet at all, but it's a pepper jam, hot pepper jam. It's made out of um, Scotch bonnet pepper. Scotch bonnet and tomatoes also simmered very slowly until uh, it gets to like a, a, a point where you just need a touch of it to, to live, live, liven up your dish. <laughs> and uh, the, the third one, rough, is uh, inspired by a, a condiment from Senegal as well. It's lots of parsley, fresh parsley, uh, that are cooked with, also added with some garlic, olive oil, uh, scotch bonnet pepper again, but a little less than the first one. 
And that's the, the second, uh, third condiment. And the fourth one, we have four, four of them, right? <laughs> Sorry, I should, I should know them all. I just, I just flew a red eye this, last night, so I'm like, just arrived this morning, so I'm blanking a little bit. The first one will come back and I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> But, but uh, you should know that we, we're in the process to, to battle them, so you can have them at home soon, yeah. That's the next step, yeah. yeah. All right. right, so I have a feeling that it is not an all-you-can-eat situation, so <laughs> she's going to lay down the rules. Yes, well, first of all, can we have a round of applause for such a wonderful discussion? 